Robert Hahn is professor of philosophy at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. He received his PhD in philosophy from Yale University and held teaching appointments at Yale, Brandeis, and Harvard Universities and in the University of Texas before coming to SYU. He is the author of nine books, including Archaeology and the Origins of Philosophy and the one which I already mentioned. Professor Hahn has been honored by awards as the outstanding teacher of the college and the outstanding educator at the university. Very happy to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, my ladies and gentlemen. as kiris kiri. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I'd like to start by thanking Professor Bullmann and Professor Hoverstadt for this gracious invitation. I see that there's so much for me to learn at this conference, and I hope uh, that you folks may find what I'm going to introduce as part of my research of interest to you. My plan for this evening is to get this thing to work, is, uh, come on. Here's the plan. I'm going to start with a brief introduction to help you see my research program and how it's unusual for someone who works in ancient philosophy. Then I'm going to introduce the thesis, The Metaphysics of Modular Thinking, and how that deals with the origins of Greek philosophy. Then I'm going to tell you about the structure of the module in some case studies, Anaximander and the Architects, Thales, Pythagoras, and Geometry, I hope to give you a sense of the Pythagorean theorem that, gosh, I'm sure you've never heard before because I never could find anyone to explain it to me I had to solve it. It's sort of like a murder mystery uh, without the murder. It's a whodunit where we know somehow what was done, but we didn't know who and how. I, I'd like to talk about the invention of coinage and the modernization of the polis, but I won't have time today in this fast-paced presentation. And then I'll talk about not the structure, but the process of module transformation in Aximenes and industrial textile production. Now, early in my career, I was a visiting professor in the American College of Greece. And from that experience, I created an unusual uh, study abroad program for my undergraduates, graduate students, my PhD students, uh, their parents and grandparents, and even working people in the community. And of course, we go to archaeological sites and museums, but it's a truly interdisciplinary, it's a truly team taught, four or five professors from different fields, and it's a truly hands-on approach. So we'll talk about the invention of democracy in the jury system, and then we'll recreate the trial of Socrates in an ancient bulletarian from a translation of Plato's Apology that we made ourselves. We'll discuss the invention of Olympic Games, and then Trechomen and Agonodromo will run an Olympic race in the ancient stadium. How long was the shortest race? Well, that's what we show the students. We'll make sundials on the beach as part of an introduction to ancient astronomy. And every year we perform an ancient play in an ancient theater with costumes and masks we make ourselves. Now, as my work pushed back early in my career to try to understand the who, what, when, where, and how of the origins of philosophy, I realized an important ingredient unexplored was the contribution of monumental temple architecture and building technologies to uh, the early cosmology of Anaximander, who with Thales is the first two philosophers we identify. So every year for more than 30 years, we've been going to Egypt, going to archeological sites and museums, but building a pyramid out of sugar cubes to test three theories of pyramid construction. We erect a breakable obelisk to test whether or not the Egyptians made scale models. Where's the stress point of a 300-ton object as you're trying to erect it? Come on. I know you're there. 
Everybody learns how to carve and paint hieroglyphic tablets by the red grid square technique, which is an important point of my presentation today. Everyone learns how to make papyrus because that's key to the industry of writing. And every year, we recreate a mummification ritual. We take the most annoying person in the group, <laughs> of course, lighthearted Bethos, but everybody remembers better when you do it together. The hands-on approach is the key to my research. So, now let's get into the theme. Aristotle said that Thales was the first philosopher because he posited source and substance monism. The source monist maintains, says Aristotle, there was an originating source. Thales called it water, Anaximenes called it air, Heraclitus called it fire, from which everything in the cosmos comes. That's not the debate. The debate is substance monism because the substance monist holds that this heavy object, this delicious liquid in the cup, the fire at the stove, and the air I'm breathing are all that basic stuff altered without changing. That's the key concept. The whole idea of modularity is substance monism. That means that there is no change, only modification. And therefore, of appearances is really only an illusion. Things look different, but really there's only one basic underlying stuff. And that's the thesis I'm going to argue because the critics of Aristotle claim, modern critics, that while they were source monists, they weren't substance monists. That there's no evidence of the Greeks from the sixth century who had a conception of an underlying unity capable of altering without changing. That's substance monism no evidence for the module. Now, in my presentation, I am going to argue that Anaximander followed the architects and learned something about modular thinking. He not only followed the modularity of the thinking, he took the architect's module. How so? Got to wait. Be right there. Then Thales and geometry Pythagorean theorem, and that shows you there's an underlying problem of constructing the cosmos out of right triangles. Sorry. And then we're going to talk about the process of modular transformation, which is the theory of the production of the felting of wool. Now, here's the cast of characters in the first story. Anaximander, who is living on these dates, and contemporaneously, Theodorus, the architect of the Temple of Herod Samos, and Chersophron and Metagenes, the architects of the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. Come on, come on, I know you're there. Yes, okay, so my first claim is the community of architects and early philosophers were overlapping. Thales and Anaximander didn't work at the University of Miletus to have a department in one section of the building, that these people were all part of the same broad community. Here's the argument. I'll get it. Uh, I discussed this in, in two of my books, and if some of you might be interested in getting more, this is just a slice out of it. Anaximander is credited with writing the first philosophical book in prose. Only the architects were producing prose treatises at the same time in the same place. The architects needed a module, a one over many, to control the aesthetics of the gigantic building. And the architect's module was column diameter. Anaximander likened the shape and size of the earth to a three by one column drum and measured out the cosmos in earthly, that is, column drum diameters. The Anaximander not only imagined the cosmos in modular terms, but he adopted the architect's module because he came to envision the cosmos as cosmic architecture, an architecture built in stages, just like the temple. All cosmological thinking supposes that the world we live in now was not how it was at the beginning, and so you have to provide the stages that led up to it, just like building the temple. So, where did the Greeks learn how to build monumental stone uh, uh, temples in Egypt. 
Look, here's the story. Here on the west coast of Turkey is Miletus. They came down this way, and they came in the end of the seventh century as seafaring people, experts in building ships and mercenaries, and they helped Pharaoh Psamtik wrestle control away from the Nubians and so install Psamtik with the double crown. The grateful Pharaoh let the Milesians alone have a colony here in the Nile Delta called Naukratis. It was from there that the Greeks, especially the Milesians, not only traded but learned many Egyptian things. Now take a look at the achievements credited to Anacrates. He's credited with introducing the gnomon into Greece, made a sundial using it, M map of the earth, a model of the cosmos, made an outline of geometry. Thales measured the height of a pyramid by its shadows when the shadow equals the height, and when the shadow was unequal to the height, measured the distance of a ship at sea, made some astronomical prediction, a solar eclipse, I doubt it, diverted a river for Croesus's army, went to Egypt and introduced geometry into Greece and perfected some theorems, both empirically and more generally. Now, Theodorus, the architect of the Temple of Herod, some invented or introduced the set square, the rule, the key, the construction plumb, transformed the potter's wheel into a lathe, credited with diverting the river Imbrasus so he could set the temple platform, and with Roikos invented a new technique for casting bronze and wrote a prose treatise, just like Anaximander. Chersophron and Metagenes are the architects of the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. They created with moving column drums by creating a wheel around them and then using that device, doubling it, to make use of the architrave as an axle. Girl, come on. So here's the reconstruction by Kulton of what the devices look like. I want you to think that the building of a temple was a veritable experimental laboratory in applied geometry that lasted for decades. Now, when they were building multi-column temples where they were roughly 20 meters tall, 60 feet tall, they had the difficulty of delivering more than 100 columns to a building site, and they decided, as the Egyptians had, it was easy to move drums. But when you move the drums, now you have a technical problem of installation. And the answer to the solution was anathenosis. You take the lip the theater. You take the lip and you smooth it to a plane, and then you make the inside guran, you make it concave, so that when you put one on top of the other, there's no rocking back and forth. You can see it's a circular empoleon. Now to do so, the technique requires that the center is exactly equidistant from the circumference, equidistant from the extremes. In Anaximander's cosmos, we begin with an undifferentiated unity. Right, we're back to that substance monism idea, a source monism. And from that, there's a seed, a gonemon, which gives rise to the opposites, hot and cold, wet and dry. The next stage is that the hot and dry form the fire around the outside like bark around the tree. The universe is a great tree for him. And the cold, moist earth is at the center. And then, spinning around, that broke off into a series of concentric wheels of which the sun is a fiery wheel, the moon is a fiery wheel, the stars, notice they're closer than the earth. But we don't see the sun as a fiery wheel, right? That's because it's so hot, it produces so much evaporation that the moist air felts, congeals around the wheel, and what we see is the sun is the puncture hole on the inside of the wheel. I like that sound, by the way. It's now, what evidence do we have for how Anaximander imagined this cosmic picture? I said, follow the architects, because he's already using the architectural module. And if so, I invited myself to see that maybe he thought analogously of a plan and elevation view. So we have evidence from Egypt that they routinely thought of, of plan views. Elevation is the view we all have 
walking up to buildings. That was used to sell the patron and the overall agreement of what the building was to look like. And we have other examples. Many of them here is found in, in the quarries of Sheikh Said. It's an a informal sketch of a multi-column temple. And here is the sketch which was in the dump found outside of the tomb of Ramses IX. But once again, it's a planned view. Now, if, for those of you who are, not, who are architects, th this is not a surprise. But those of you who are not, it's hard to figure out how this thing has this ground plan. But you need this ground plan because the architect has to control each stage as it goes up and therefore requires a point of view that no one actually has. It's an imaginative projection, I might say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. Yeah. So, oh boy. So, I conjectured that if this was the case, now take a look. Anaximander's cosmos in plan, it's not quite a plan, because Aristotle said Anaximander's Earth was aloft in the center of the cosmos, held up by nothing. Held up by nothing? It was equidistant from all the extremes, and it had no reason to go left, right, up, or down. So it stays at the center. So it's a horizontal cross-section through the plane of the Earth. We'll call it a plan. And in this plan view, it's very different than what looks like a cosmic axle, which is the cosmos looked from the side. And I'm emphasizing this because only in the plan view is the Earth, homoiotata prostaeschata, is it equidistant from the extremes, not in the elevation view. And so, if we think about the cosmic view of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the Earth, and here's a piece, very little of the archaic building still survives. You can see the round Empoleon. It looks like a small version of the whole cosmos. Yes, that's right. It's the vision that the little world and the big world share the same structure. And while you and I can't get to the sun, moon, and stars, we can infer its structure because, as I'll repeat three times in different cases today, the small world and the big world share the same structure. So here's that combination view of the plan and the elevation. And now in another one of my books, I deal with the theory about numbers and proportion, not only in architecture, but in sculpture, in poetry, and even the patterning of making roof tiles, because the roof is a cosmic heaven. Now, here's the module. Now the module number nine. We meet the Iliad in the ninth year of the war, and we're told it'll end in the tenth. Nine plus one. In the beginning of the Odyssey, we're told, it'll take Odysseus nine years to get home from the Trojan War, coming home in the twentieth. Nine plus one. Great amounts of time. Hesiod, how big is the, how high is the heaven? Take an acme, an anvil, and let it drop. <laughs> like the noise. It'll bottom out on the 10th day, 9 plus 1 to the surface of the earth. Open the gates of, Tar of Hades. Let it drop. <laughs> It'll fall 9 days and nights and bottom out on the 10th. 9 plus 1, 9 plus 1 also shows great amounts of distance. The distance of the next commander to the stars is nine plus one Earth diameters. The distance to the moon is plus nine. The distance to the wheel of the sun is plus nine. So it has a cosmic meaning in this context. And the Ionic architects, they made their columns nine or nine plus one greater than column diameter. So while here, Weisenberg has a theory about the column, the relation between column diameter and the height, which is different than Christian by one, the debate is where exactly on the lower diameter do you make the measurement? So it's nine or 10, nine or nine plus one. It's once again, the same modular measurement. So when the, a temple plan is laid out, as Coulton explains, each square is column diameter with column uh, into column distance. 
Anaximander set out column drum, column drum, column drum, and each module is one diameter thick. 9, 18, 27, the same series as involved in the other modular discussion. So as I'm finishing this thing up now, come join me. We're standing in front of a reconstruction of the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. And you say, I know, what, what do you say? You say, well, I see stairs, I see a stylobate, I see the plinth, I see the column base, I see the column shaft, the capital, the architrave, the frieze, and the upper orders of the entablature. And I'm saying to you, you missed the most important part. It's all alterations of the fundamental unit of lower diameter. There's one unit that doesn't alter, that alters without changing. You're not seeing all these different things. You're seeing a unity in its alteration. At the same time of, of Greek philosophy in the sixth century, the architect's temples were born modules. The argument for a module is an argument for substantialism, and the underlying unity that altered without changing, column diameter expressed as nine or nine plus one. And Examander imagined the cosmos by means of an architectural technique. Now, second, case study. This is from um, Annex, my, my newest book. It, I'm going to um, reverse engineer the discovery. This is from Plato's Timaeus, written in the middle of the fourth century. Timaeus of Locri from southern Italy, a Pythagorean place, is talking to Socrates. He says, in the first place, then, it's of course obvious to anyone, <coughs> really, that earth, water, and air are bodies. All bodies have volume. Volume, moreover, must be bounded by surface, and every surface that's rectilinear is composed of triangles. Now, all triangles derive their origin from two triangles, each having one right angle and the other acute. Interpretation, please. The right triangle is the module for the whole cosmos. Now, what proof did they have that the right triangle is the fundamental geometrical figure and the fundamental building block? I'm saying that it's the so-called Pythagorean theorem, the hypotenuse theorem. But which one? There's more than 400 proofs of it. That means each one reveals a different aspect of the right triangle. So which one shows that the right triangle is the fundamental geometrical figure? I'm glad you asked. If you think it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared, you'll never find it because the Greeks didn't have algebra. That's algebra. And the only two proofs that we have from the Greeks are in Euclid, book one and book six. No numbers are used. It has nothing to do with numbers. It's the wrong thing if you want to make some discovery. Now, in this second story, new cast of characters, Thales, and Pythagoras. The usual story for my colleagues who work in ancient mathematics is that Hippocrates of Chios, who produced the first Torcheia, is able to prove the quadrature of the loons, a geometrical problem, requiring a knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem. So it had to be known before him. Now, some of my colleagues, but not all, think that Hippasus, the discovery of incommensurability, was his, which resides in book 10 of Euclid, and that supposition was that if that was known, it requires a proof of the Pythagorean theorem, so it had to be known before. And I'm saying, in, in my view, they missed it by at least half a century. It was visualized by Thales and plausibly proved by Pythagoras. Here's that story now. Thales visualized it, Pythagoras plausibly proved it, and it was not the proof in book one but a rather a less sophisticated view of the proof in 631, the proof by similar triangles. So now I've got to create the case that Thales understood similar triangles because that proof is a natural consequence, and it shows that the right triangle is the fundamental geometrical figure. The visualization and proof that the right triangle is the basic geometrical figure and the cosmos is built out of them is an argument for substance monism an underlying unity altering without changing. Thus, the right triangle is the module. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, Thales went to Egypt. We have a reliable report from Aristotle's student who wrote the first history of mathematics, Eudemus, that he went to Egypt and he re and introduced geometry into Greece. What could he have learned? Well, la from land serving, he learned that the triangle was the fundamental geometrical figure. From the painters, he learned the microcosmic, macrocosmic And from the Rhine mathematical papyrus, mathematical papyrus, the area of triangles and measuring the height of the pyramid, though he didn't use that technique. So come on with me to Egypt now and let's take another look. Herodotus said the pharaoh divided all of the land into squares. But we know they weren't tetragona, they were orthogonia, they were rectangles. Of course, the square is a specific case, an equilateral rectangle. Every year the Nile flooded, and every year the land had to be resurveyed. Here I am uh, recently, a couple of years ago, standing at the Temple of Isis at Philae, and when I first came here, I don't know, three and a half decades ago, I asked my colleague why they changed the color of the stone for the upper half of the building. And he said, they didn't change the color of the stone. That's how high the flood went. That's how high the flood went, 15 meters. So when I say that, the land was eviscerated. Sometimes the banks of the Nile were washed into the sea. Sometimes it stirred up so much mess that every man who worked the land was taxed on the area. So every man had to have returned to him a plot of the same area, but not always the same shape. And so you can see before the new high dam, the Nile got right back here from the ancient building. The Nile is five kilometers away. Talking about a tremendous amount of flooding. So here's what happened. This is from the tomb of Mena, a new kingdom. This fine fellow has the royal cubit cord. This guy has the was scepter, which is the stakes. He staked out the land, and the cord was stretched around it. These two fine fellows have the ink block. They're the priests recording the result. And we, we understand how this tomb painting is made. A master craftsman works on square grids with rules like from the bottom of the foot to the chin, 19 uh, and a half uh, squares, and to the top of the head, 22, so each figure becomes recognizable. But that meant they understood, or at least Thales understood, that the little world and the big world shared the same structure. The big world was only a scaled up version of the little world. And we have many examples with the, with the red grid drawing still in place in both artifacts and here the whiteboard in the British Museum. Now this changed my whole view. This was problem 51 in the Rhine Mathematical Papyrus. It tells you how to calculate a triangular plot of land. What's that doing there? Answer, space is imagined as flat. Every man had returned to him a plot of equal area for tax purposes, but not always in the same shape. Aerial equivalences are determined by reducing every figure to triangles and every figure equals the sum of its triangles. That was the point that the triangle was the basic building block. And I believe when Thales came back to Greece, Miletus, he either learned or confirmed that the triangle was the basic building block. And since I'm arguing for anyone who maintained that water was the basis of everything, and that somehow it gets repackaged or recombined to be this hard surface, to be the air I breathe, to be the liquid in the cup that I need a sip of, and the fire with the stove. Somebody had to explain what was the basic figure that gets recombined. And so we decided to look into triangles. So now, he measured the height of the pyramid at a time of day when the shadow equals the height. The only way he could know that it was time to make this measurement is he had a gnomon here and he could see that this shadow was equal to this height. I hope someone in the question period will ask me about this. This is a much more complicated story. Now, had he measured and my argument is that he did, he would have seen that the only way to make the experiment is by an understanding of similar right triangles. Similar figures have the same shape 
but different size. The little world and the big world share, share the same structure. He's also just measuring the height when the shadow was unequal but proportional. So he reasoned this length was to this height as this shadow length was to that height. Again, similar right triangles. Then he's credited with measuring the distance of a ship at sea. And I've done this many times with my students. What we do is I get everybody to line up along the coast, we sight a boat, and then we have the line put in, which is a measured cord, and we sight the ship. If you make a diagram, come on, you can see that I'm standing there, my students are across, and we come this way. We don't know how long this is, but since they're similar triangles, this length is that distance. Similar right triangles. But because the beach is generally so narrow, people had suggested that he probably did it from a raised uh, tower. Whether it was unequal, in every case, it relies on similar right triangles. This guy is focused on similar right triangles. And so when I put the examples together of the measurement of the distance of ship at sea from the shoreline, the measurement from a raised tower, and the measurement of the pyramids, I realized it was all the same diagram, all similar right triangles. Because similar right triangles is the key to understanding the Pythagorean theorem. Now, let's put that together with the theorems with which he's credited. If two straight lines intersect, the angles opposite are equal. Now, the important one for today, if a triangle has two sides equal, the angle opposite must be equal. Thales' theorem, isosceles triangle. In every circle, the diameter divides it into two equal portions. And there's the, there's the money moment. Every triangle made on the diameter is a right triangle. Here comes the story. Now, in order to move ahead, you have to see that the Pythagoreans are credited with proving there are two right angles in every triangle, proving. But we have an ancient report that Thales and his generation investigated, theorized, how there were two right angles in every species of triangle. Now, there's a bunch of ways it could be done. This is what he learned in Egypt, the triangle's rectangle. By the way, it's the same argument for all three cases, so let's start there. You take a triangle and you drop a perpendicular which divides it in half. Then you complete the rectangle. Now every rectangle has four right angles. So this triangle has two right angles, it's half the rectangle. And this half triangle has two right angles. Now take away these two right angles, every triangle has two right angles. He can't go further, he has to know that. If somebody wants to argue against the case, you can try to argue there. And now he knows from, already from Egypt that every figure on a flat surface divides into a number of triangles, add up the area of each of the triangles, and you know the area of the figure. Now the missing piece. He knows that the triangle is a basic building block. He wonders, is there anything inside a triangle that would tell me that something more fundamental? And he found it. He dropped the perpendicular, and he realized that inside every triangle were two right triangles. By the way, this isn't rocket science. He's just spending time looking. And then he divides from the right angle, and he discovers that every time you divide from the right angle, you produce two similar right triangles, each one similar to the big guy and it will divide indefinitely. It's not an atomic conception because there's no smallest right triangle, but it's an endless divide of two right angle triangles, two right angle triangles, similar, 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 all the way down as the saying goes. So, in the six out of the seven surviving diagrams in the medieval, who are the earliest uh, state, uh, earliest versions of Euclid that survive. Every one but the seventh has exactly this diagram for 631. No figures on the sides. It shows you that inside every right triangle are right triangles all the way down. That's why it was this interpretation, because its metaphysical meaning 
was that the right triangle was the fundamental building block. So here's how this thing works. Take any right triangle, the right angle at A, drop a perpendicular. It divides the big guy into the medium-sized guy and the little guy. Same shape, different size. Now he looks into the, the circle. There's two reasons, one small one, one big one. He now wants to look inside the right triangle to see if he missed something. In doing so, this is the important part, he needs to have a reliable method to make sure he's got a right triangle. He thinks he's found it. There's a more important reason, but this is how we begin. Take the isosceles right triangle. He needs to show that angle A equals a right angle. He knows there's two right angles in every triangle. This is a right angle, and these two have to be equal because this is a radius of the circle and so is that. So, same story here. So alpha plus beta have to be a right angle, each being half a right angle. Now he wonders if to move the point further around the circle, whether he'll get the same result. It's the same argument. This is a radius and this is a radius, so A equals A. This is a radius and this is a radius, so beta equals beta. And now in the triangle, alpha plus beta plus alpha beta equal two right angles. Alpha beta has to equal a right angle. Now he's got a way to be sure he's investigating right triangle. And then he looks inside and here's what he finds. He always started with the isosceles right triangle because the aerial equivalences are immediately obvious. I know you're going to see it. <laughs> the square on the perpendicular, since this is radius, this is a radius, and this is on the perpendicular equals the figure made by this length and take this as the width because all of them are radii, so this square equals this rectangle, which turns out to be a square. Then he moves the point over and he wonders, is this square equal to this length and this width? And he does not by a proof, but empirically, like the architects on the surface, he's able to make that measurement. And thereby he now knows that all the right triangles expand or contract according to a pattern. And that pattern we call the geometric mean or a continuous proportion. And so that's the case where a square equals a rectangle. This is to this as this is to this. We would say, a is to C as B squared. But the geometer says the square on B equals the rectangle made by A and C. Now he wonders, are there any other geometric means? And this is the Pythagorean theorem. He, again, he started with the same diagram. And now he makes a square on this side. And he knows this piece is equal to this piece. So the square has four equal pieces. Then he takes this length and drops it to make this rectangle with the same four equal pieces. And now he knows that the square on this hypotenuse equals the rectangle made by the hypotenuse and the shorter side and confirmed it here. That was the discovery of the Pythagorean theorem. And what we have here then is how I imagine Pythagoras took what he did and made the proof. Now Thales, back to Thales. So somebody, when he said all figures, space is flat, all figures reduce to triangles, somebody said, and I left off, Baragalo, said, one minute, please. That can't be right for the circle. The circle is not made of triangles. Triangles are pointy. But ladies and gentlemen, the circle is built out of right triangles. Even the circle, not only the rectilinear figures, are made of triangles. Yeah, ma'am. Oh, gosh. So if you put all the possible triangles, you get the concept of a geometric loci, and the circle is constructed out of right triangles. So apparently on this discovery, Pythagoras made a great sacrifice. A hundred oxen or oxen. 
and Thales made the great sacrifice, and many of my colleagues think, oh, it's just they're mixing up the one report with the other. No, they're not. Pythagoras is celebrating not merely that on the, the strange anomaly, that on the, the figure on the hypotenuse is equal in area to the sum of the figures on the two sides, he discovered, proved, that the right triangle was the basic building block of the cosmos. And Thales discovered that even the circle was built out of right triangle. That was the reason for the sacrifice. Now, the next stages I'm going to touch on very briefly, which are these. The Pythagoras is also credited with the application of areas. I have read as many books as I can. I never found anyone to explain it. I'm going to try, I'm offering you an explanation. I, I think I know what it was. Take a triangle in any angle, remember inside every triangle are the right triangles, and make this into a parallelogram of equal area and attach it to the line. Then take any figure and divide it into triangles, just like this, and make a figure equal in area and attach it to BC. And then find the geometric mean between these two pieces, which is GH, and construct a triangle on this base that is similar to this and equal in area to this. This was part of the project of explaining how right triangles and triangles transform into all the other shapes so that you could explain why this thing over here was hard and this thing, yeah, finally, is liquid and fire and so on. And then the next step attributed to Pythagoras is the sustasis of the regular God bless me. And that was he wanted to see how many regular equilateral triangles, squares, and pentagons could be constructed around a single point and still fold up. These are the elements. And in Plato, we have then the construction of the regular solids. We have the tetrahedron, which was fire, the octahedron, folded up, which is air, the icosahedron, 20-sided figure, which is water, and the hexahedron, or the cube, which is earth. And so now, we're back to where I started, this is the end of that story, we're back to now the construction of the cosmos out of right triangles. And just to remind you, this is the story. We started here in the fourth century to look backwards. It led to the regular solids, but it was based on the sustasis the construction of them simply by Pythagoras, the application of areas, the transformation of each of the forms from triangles into all the other shapes, and that is from the Pythagorean theorem that showed that the right triangle was the fundamental geometrical figure. So the argument that the right triangle is the fundamental building block of the cosmos is the case for substance monism. It was the visualization and proof of the so-called Pythagorean theorem by similar triangles the right triangle is the module. Now, the last and shortest of my presentations, the felting of wool. Geometry offered the insight into the structure of the underlying unity. The fundamental geometrical structure is the right triangle. But what is the process by which the unity transforms into diverse appearances? By what process or mechanism do the right triangles recombine or repackage to produce such divergent appearance. Come on. Arist is Aristotle's claim that Thales and Anaximenes were source monists and substance monists historically appropriate? Now I'm back to the original argument that some of Aristotle's critics claim no, and I've been trying to show you that at the same time they worked, we have evidence for substance monism all around them. What kinds of evidence should also count as historically appropriate? Graham, for instance, claims that substance monism is not historically appropriate, and these are arguments, together with this one, and the modernization of the polis, the invention of coinage, of the same kind to show that he was mistaken. <laughs> now, Graham's theory is this. They were source monists. You begin with water or air, state. And with each successive state, the original perishes, 
and there's no return to the original state upon dissolution. So that means, the thesis is, that there is no underlying substrate, there is no underlying substance monism, and hence there really is change more than just alteration. Now we have evidence from Simplicius, Hippolytus, Aetius, and Pseudo-Plutarch that goes like this for Anaximedes. When air is rarer, less pressed, it becomes fire. But when it's more pressed, when it felt, it becomes wind, press it more, it becomes cloud, press it more, it becomes rain, press it more, it becomes river and streams, press it more, it becomes earth, press it more, it becomes stone. Let me do that one more time. When air becomes rarer, it becomes fire. But when it felts, it becomes wind, cloud, rain, river and streams, press it more earth, press it more stone. So now I wonder, is there some way to test Aristotle versus his critics? So I wondered, is there anyone still making felt in the tribal way? And if so, could I photograph them and maybe decide the issue? Well, finally, I found them in Ture and I photographed them. And then you can take a look and see what you think. The cosmic process of transformation of appearances are explicated by means of the technical analogy of pilesis of material. Now, what did Anaximedes and his compatriots witness when they watched the felter at work? Would the process and the final product lend themselves to an interpretation of substance monism, or rather the general substance theory. I'm arguing that when we view this traditional process of felting, an exercise in experimental archaeology, we're witnessing the very same process, Caterus Paribus, that Anaximenes and his compatriots witnessed. We have surviving examples here from Pazarik, from the fifth century BCE, and the felts chemically are exactly the same. So here's what we know watching the felter. First, you shear the sheep, and then you pick away the, the dirt so that you have clean wool. Then you need a mat, and this mat is made from the reeds of the Meander River, the same ones. It was made 150 years ago by the great-great-great-grandfather of this felter. And with string, you hold the thing together. Now what happens, oh gosh, is you start with a colorful motif, and then on top of it, fill up the wool. And as soon as I saw that, I said, there's the cloud. And then I watched the next step of the felter. He was moistening, I said, Vrech, there's the rain. And then what happens is they roll it up tightly, and then, like a Greek dance, they push, 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 and in about 10 minutes, they have the finished product, which I have in my room and I forgot to bring. No! Oh! Look at this other felter. When the stuff is heaped up, it looks like clouds with the rain. And now comes the pivotal question when we finish watching the process and see the resulting compressed felt. What did Anaximenes and his compatriots, who were surely his audience, plausibly believe they saw? Was it the generating substance theory? Did they believe that the felt was something new, a genuine coming to be in which the original materials perished in the process? Or was it, in fact, an argument for substance monism? Did they believe it was the same materials cloud-like wool, rain-sprinkled water, rolled, compressed, and matted, transformed, altered without changing. Simplicius gives us the report in his commentary on Aristotle's physics. Those who suppose that the principle is one and in motion, such as Thales and Anaximenes, make creation happen by rarefaction and pugnosis, compression. And at first, I was not sure when I saw this being done, and then I came to the conclusion that the transformation of appearances are not simply cloud to rain, but a richly complex combination of ingredients, each contributing to the other's complex appearances. The only
only thing distinguishing one form from the other was compression, how compressed the item was. So, conclusions. The Milesians were metaphysicians, modular thinkers. Aristotle's report is right. The Milesians were source and substance monists. The sixth century evidence for substance monism was a module. First, they shared with the architects modular thinking. There's an underlying unity that alters without changing, column diameter and nine or nine plus one. Geometry revealed the fundamental structure, the right angle, it was an interpretation of the Pythagorean theorem. I'm calling that in my new book, The Lost Narrative. And the process by which the alterations transform is compression. Vielen Dank, Hoffnung, Sie hatten einigen Spaß mit mir an diesen Abend. Yeah, take a little one. Still alive? We have time for questions. Elias, you must have questions. <laughs> Anybody? Yes. Okay, that was great. Thank you. Um, I really had just kind of a basic question. So you said very early on that um, you connected, sorry, let me just make sure, that the uh, an Axmander and the early Milesian philosophers, or an Axmander in particular wrote in prose, that's one of the credits, right? The, that an Axmander wrote in prose. Yes. And you also said that the architects were the only people who wrote in prose. And I was wondering why. Why would it only be architects, especially if they're the ones kind of working with this cosmic geometry and, and things like that? Why prose in particular? Well, it so happens there's one other author, uh, which is Phericides wrote a, uh, Theologos, and he wrote a piece on the marriage of Zeus and Chthone. But with that exception, it, the reason that the architects wrote in prose is they were communicating something about their craft. Here's how I think it happened. Uh, Theodoros and Roy, Theodoros was in charge of building the temple of Hera at Samos. We know that based on pottery that's broken beneath the foundation, it dates to 570. He made the building, and we believe that the building was Dipteros I, the first double peristyle limestone building in, in Tehera in Samos, was finished around 550. And then the building began to list, not fire, after 1978, we knew that it wasn't fire. The building was taken down, and it was rebuilt, this time with sand around the perimeter. At the same time, we know we have a story that uh, Hersofron and Metagenes had a problem setting the foundation because all these cases are building in a female nature goddess places, swamp. And swamp is not a good place to make a construction because of the heavy weight. So Theodorus was called over to consult, and I believe at that point he wrote a prose treatise to help other people figure out how to do the building. And he also gave, this is Coulton's theory, and I'm, I'm confident he's right about this, they gave the theory of proportions. So Anaximander, and, and poetry is too imprecise to make a building. And Anaximander, not to be undone, did them one step better. The great temples, there's nothing more important in the ancient archaic community than monumental temple building, which went on for decades and mesmerized the community. It literally transformed the horizon in which they came to see their place and themselves. And so I take it, and Examander said, since everybody was hello to the architect, I can do you one better, because I'm going to tell you the whole structure of the cosmos. And we think that story begins from the beginning of the world 
and that it works itself out cosmologically to the present day. So I think that the architects were working in prose because it was amenable to the presentation. And my hypothesis is that Alex Amanda followed the architect. Well, maybe I can follow up on this. No, because, so, I mean, there is a, I don't know what to call it, but there's a kind of a structure that the, the stories that you find, which are truly fascinating, they kind of are also forms of celebration, right? So of, of what you call the likeness between the small and the large world. But from your question I take, and that's a bit my question as well, the especially the genre of prose is not really a celebrational genre of writing. It's one which wants to give instruction. So there is a kind of a tension between an attention to this phenomena through the lens of architecture which utters itself in a kind of a celebrational form, while at the same time the communication about it happens in prose. So instructive, directional, prosaic. What do you think of that? Well, I, I do have a, a reply. I don't know whether you'll find it persuasive. I take this up in chapter five of my book, Annex of Management, The Architects, and it looks like this. So there was a change in archaic Greece and how traditional authority was being waged. Here's the quick background. There was a time that only the aristocrats fought and they were the only ones heavily armed. So in Homer, when somebody is out to kill somebody else, they have a little contest. Everybody forms a circle and Menelaus comes in with Paris and they say, hey, let's get going here because let's get this thing over with. One of you will kill the other and we can go home now. But it happens with, uh, with uh, Diomedes and Glaucus in many cases, and individual people fought. But come the turn of the 8th to the 7th century, there was resurgence of trade with the East, which brought metallurgical techniques to Greece. And that people to fight against the neighboring factions that were coming to kill them. And the plan was that that was great, until there was a year of drought and the food provisions were in the fortifications with 50 or 60 war-hardened aristocrats who were inside and they found a thousand of the heavily armed town people banging furiously at their door. And they said, uh, oh yeah, uh, we meant to invite you, come on in, because otherwise all done. My point is that there was a transformation in the political hierarchy about the distribution of traditional authority. And prose got away from the Homeric ethos of the traditional authority. What is that traditional authority? In Odyssey, book 18, Odysseus sings what I call the hymn to aristocracy. In a world of chaos and confusion, no one knows when good times turn bad. And humans are the most helpless of all creatures. So better accept the state that you're in. Don't rock the boat. That's good if you're on top of the food chain. Not so good if you're lower. And I think that prose was connected in part to a shifting emphasis of the language of traditional authority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, two questions. Mina. I have two questions. Actually, the first one is a comment more than a question. Uh, when you showed the infinite tessellation of the triangle, yeah, I think this could be actually seen as the f as a precursor to uh, fractal fractals, right? It happened much later. It came much later, but it could be or right, but it it's conceptually conceptually. And the second thing is um, the idea of the triangle as the s as the smallest unit or the module. Yeah, um, I mean this describes in a certain sense a kind of uh, ge uh, algebraic geometry. Yeah, but would you see or could you translate this in the, uh, first into top topology, or mm. how would you translate this in? in a topological scope 
And the second question is in uh, morphology, like because if you, if you take morphogenesis, how would you deal then with the conformations of the triangle and how would the triangle relate to, to a morphogenetic structure? M maybe I misunderstand your second point. So let me start into that first. And you tell me I I'm going the wrong direction. If there is a basic underlying unity that alters without changing, you get bigger and smaller, you can change the shape of it, but it's always the same area. Yeah. Then that was the, the idea of the program was to explain how everything could be water or air and sometimes hard and sometimes light and sometimes fiery and so on. So that was the morphology that I think I was following out with the application of areas. Is that not the, the direction you had in mind? Yeah, exactly, but I would, I would, I would uh, uh, do it in the extreme and think about biology. Like if you, if you take uh, the embryonic uh, uh, evolution, for example, how would you understand then uh, the idea of the triangle? Or, 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 or would we need to switch to another concept or to another module which would then even work in biology? This is what... Well, Thales, we don't have the evidence for biology, but we do for Anaximander. Anaximander realized that when humans are born, they're completely helpless. Unlike the giraffe and other animals, the baby drops, and within 30 minutes it has to get up and go or finish. So Anaximander imagined that we must have been born under the water in thorny barks, because otherwise we would all be dead. We'd all be scavenged. So he has an evolutionary concept biologically, but I don't see that in Thales. So that's a sense in which I don't see a matching of one to the other, although I see the source monism as becoming substance monism. So we're lacking the information, though one of my colleagues at the University of London has this idea about various flies that he thinks he can trace to an examander and their evolutionary development. Um, thank you. I, I have a great deal of um, sympathy with uh, uh, th the stories that you're telling, and you know this kind of artisanal, uh, even um, uh, you know, um, chartered surveying um, foundation of, of cosmological theories. I, I, I love the stuff. I have a question. It's, it's just a little nag, I suppose, and that is um, that when we when we talk of um, the great cosmologists. Um, we tend to think of them doing metaphysics. And your, your story really does very effectively debunk the, 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 the sense of that, I suppose. Nevertheless, we could, we could um, raise some questions about where metaphysics lies in all of this. And I'm hoping I remember correctly, because it seems to me, uh, 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 was it not Anaximenes Anax who said that um, no matter how small a sample of, of stuff that you have, it has the same proportion of uh, the basic elements in it, and will always have. You go smaller and smaller and smaller, it still has the same proportion of basic elements. Um, and I, it seems like that's a reasonable conclusion that you might come to <coughs> Um, from from the story about felting uh, and, and watching such a process, but it's, it seems to me then that you have m maybe a point, uh, a point along the line, where to make a principle of something becomes the metaphysical element, um, and I, I, do I wonder what your thoughts are about where the shading might occur, if it occurs at all. Is it is it are we right in thinking of them as as metaphysicists? Um. I, I want to be sure I followed your question. I, I'll answer it in a, a way that has always made me feel surprised. When I've sometimes sent papers to conferences, I find that out of 27 papers I'm on three judges, I'm both one and 27. That is, people can't figure out what to do. And often, the stuff in my most recent book, I have a, a couple of new books that are in the, in the process. One deals with the discovery of incommensurability and the other one which uh, deals with, um, uh, it's called ancient practices, how these practices fit together. But people regard that my work in the last book was ancient mathematics, but it's ancient metaphysics. The mathematics part 
was, I, I thought, that was what was missing. Thales did geometry, and Thales somehow was involved in supposing there was an underlying unity of all things. That means the world is illusory. So how is it that this one thing shows up as all this different stuff? So I think that the, the point is that what I'm calling the lost narrative, I'm trying to connect how it was connected. It's memorialized in Plato, and it looks back to Thales. So that ancient mathematics was part, was the handmaiden to metaphysics. Thank you. Was that a question here? Yes. Um, I was just wondering if, if Thales would, would he accept this statement that he can divide uh, uh, a triangle that he can measure the size uh, infinite times at a so that in the end he would say that it is possible that a finite uh, size can have infinite parts. Infinite parts. Parts. If I may, and I hope you will take no disrespect, but to answer this in, in a, a good way to end this section. There's a famous quip attributed to William James, Bertrand Russell, which goes this way. Thing comes from water, and then the question was, well, what held up the water? And then the answer was, oh, well, it was Atlas. Atlas was holding up the water. Oh, okay then, said the, the young slave boy who was asking, and he said, well, who's holding up Atlas? And the answer was, oh, a Atlas is standing on a turtle. On a turtle? Oh, okay, fine. And then the what's that turtle? The answer by Thales was another turtle. And at each point, the young boy was convinced and then mesmerized. He couldn't figure it out. Well, what's that turtle? Turtle. And then he says, but, but hold it. And what's that turtle standing on? And, and then that turtle. And Thales looks at him and says, young man, it's turtles all the way down. Now, this is, I've never in this, but I've been assured that it's supposed to be, and that William James or Bertrand Russell made it to describe Thales' doctrine. What my thesis says is it's right triangles all the way down, and that there's no smallest right triangle, so that it was an infinite divide, so it wasn't an atomic conception. What's important is what we, at least, he, I believe he took with him, which was that he came from Egypt with the understanding, learned or confirmed, that the triangle was the basic building block. This was imagined like Then he looked inside every infinitely divided. So we know that Annex, according to debates, had held that there were infinite worlds. By that in the concept of infinity in the sixth century. So I think that given that information, and at least it had been where the idea of an infinite divide would not have been troublesome, would not have been impossible, even though it suggests a lack of rationality. Does that help at all? Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.